Well, this is uh, my second appearance at the Baker Institute. In 1998, I came here when I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Bob, you ought to pay attention. Uh, and I said something vaguely supportive about the estate tax. And there was an editorial about me in the Houston Chronicle a few days later titled Outrageous. Uh, so be careful what you say. <laughs> so just a disclaimer right from. Actually, it was a letter. No, there. A letter to the editor. Oh, it was a letter? Yeah. Oh, darn. I thought it would be right behind you. I thought it was an editorial. <laughs> it was an nasty letter. <laughs> it was a nasty letter. Uh, I, I, I've saved it. Uh, so, disclaimer nothing I say should be construed as in any way su supporting the estate and gift tax. <laughs> and unlike last time, I'm not representing the Clinton administration. Maybe next time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> this, this is a very nice paper. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not an expert on these models. I think the last time I built a general equilibrium model, uh, some of you weren't even born. Uh, uh, but it's, you know, obviously these issues are terribly important, and finding a systematic way to incorporate as many of these effects as possible into a comprehensible model, I think, is very, very helpful. Uh, I view these models as sort of... Uh, that as logical structures for our thinking and sort of for getting our story right more than as predictions as what, of what's going to happen because there's so many moving pieces and I guess and, and and George and John are very clear about this I mean one of the unknowns is sort of how important the particular modeling assumptions are that you're making all the things you have to leave out and just to get these things to solve uh, that those are those are actually big unknowns, maybe even big unknowables. Although I think there are things that can be done to learn more about the effects of at least some of the assumptions. I'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, the the model shows, I think, finds very plausible results for what would happen with owner occupied housing and rental housing. I remember uh, the 1996 conference when Pat Hendershot basically got up and said the sky is falling, and then basically everybody else in the room said no, it's not. Uh, in this model, the sky is not falling. I mean, we see wild variations in user costs of housing, at least as, me as measured by uh, interest rates and tax rates. And you never see anything like that corresponding to changes in prices. And this model uh, shows, I think, in a pretty clear way why in the general equilibrium model, with even with some moderate adjustment costs, uh, you get relatively small changes in owner-occupied housing prices. Uh, the big hit on the mo the big hit in this model comes on owners of rental capital uh, because they lose a lot of depreciation deductions. Uh, rental housing is is depreciated over something like 30 years, and uh, the existing owners of rental capital would lose a lot of those depreciation deductions. And that might be the biggest surprise in the paper, at least for me, uh, but it's certainly plausible. It's interesting. It's relevant. Uh, in this model, almost everyone is better off than under the baseline scenario, uh, the progressive income tax. Wages go up, as do after-tax returns to capital. Young people work and save more, and only the current old are hurt. Uh, there's, because of the lump sum tax on old capital, and also, also because there's a progressive income tax here, and older people have got relatively lower incomes, so that when they go from the low progressive income tax rates up to the flat tax rates, they, they lose out. Um, I'm not convinced that uh, that's actually the way things would play out, but it's a, you know, it, 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 it gives you a story as to how that's the answer. Uh, the authors argue that adjustment costs moderate price responses, uh, which reduces or, or in increases in the short, or reduces in the, in the short run the welfare losses that people who lose from reform uh, and. Well, so I guess another way to put it is that the efficiency gains from model with no adjustment costs and no transition relief are vastly overstated because either there are big adjustment costs, uh, which entail real economic costs, which I think show up in this model, although they're not discussed. It actually might be, you might add that to the discussion because they, that, that, is, that, that is a cost, or there'd be a larger need for transition relief. There'd be people losing out more in the short run. Uh, which would reduce the efficiency gains from the lump sum tax on old capital. So what's known about these overlapping generation models? Well, one thing that's known is that nobody really makes decisions the way they do in these models. Uh, Jane Gravel's often pointed out how implausible it is that people would wake up and decide how hard to work now based on the opportunity cost of consumption in every future time period. Uh, the, 
big intertemporal response in this model, I, I, as I understand it, comes from people shifting leisure when they're young, so they can, uh, r rather than reducing their, their, their initial level of consumption by a lot, uh, so that they can increase future consumption and leisure. Uh, what's unknown, as, as George noted and as was noted yesterday, the key parameters. The elasticities of substitution between goods, between current and future consumption, and the adjustment costs are all highly uncertain. In the case of modeling, you know, in, in you know, for a lot of economic models, we don't really buy the underlying framework as an exact description of how people make decisions. Nobody thinks that people really maximize a utility subject to a budget constraint. But in the case of demand for goods and services, you, the predictions of the model are consistent with what you can readily observe. Price of a good goes up, quantity demanded goes down. Uh, in the case of work and saving, it's a little bit more problematic. A lot of the, the predictions of the model are not so clear. Uh, the tax rate on working goes up. People might choose to work more or less, as all economists know. Same thing for saving. Uh, economists feel comfortable saying that people respond to incentives, but that assumes that people understand the incentives. And I think that's a problem, again, in this kind of a model, to assume that people are doing intertemporal substitution based on anything other than simple rules of thumb assumes a high level of individual rationality. And you know, if you leave this room and talk to real people, you realize a lot of them are really clueless. Uh, also, a lot of the decisions, a lot of the decisions in this model rely on tax regimes remaining fixed in the future. Again, this is noted by the authors. Uh, but if consumption tax rates go up in the future, or there's an estate tax, uh, and there's a bequest motive, which actually isn't in this model, but would be in the real world, then. Uh, then the incentives would be, could be radically different than they are in this model with perfect certainty about future tax regimes. And you should recall that the economic nirvana in this model starts with confiscation of wealth from the old, which might be perceived as a bad signal if you're trying to make predictions about what's going to happen in the future, especially given future demographic you know, issues. So an unknown is how important all these unknowns are to the robustness of the bottom line conclusions. Now, even if you buy the basic framework, there are a lot of limitations in this and any overlapping generation model. And they're necessary. You have to make assumptions to actually be able to solve these models. I want to just go through some of them. One is, in this model, at least the current the version that I read, uh, they're identical individuals. In the real world, incomes and preferences vary. Uh, for one thing, this is important because there are permanent differences in ability to earn income and, in, and inherited wealth. And my understanding is that in the next version of this model, there are going to be different income classes, and that will help a lot. Uh, the model effectively assumes that there are identical firms within each sector, or just one firm that's acting like a perfectly competitive agent. Uh, so with the rep representative firm doesn't capture the fact that within real industries, there are firms that have old capital and firms that have newer capital. And it's certainly in the political dynamics, the fact that, and I think Joel talked about this in yesterday's comments, that the firms with the old capital are going to be unhappy, even if you say that on average, the industry is going to do OK. Uh, so that's going to affect the demand for transition relief. Uh, the model has three sectors, which is an improvement over two-sector model. It's good to explicitly model owner-occupied housing. But in the real world, there are going to be many sectors involved, and they'll be affected very differently. Again, going back to Joel's comments, that, 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 that's reflected in different views about the desirability of different kinds of tax reforms. And obviously, modeling more intersect intersectoral distortions would result in even bigger welfare gains as well. Uh, there's no real bequest motive in this model. People make a uh, target level of bequests regardless of tax regime, which implies, I think, that the marginal utility of bequests is zero. Uh, you get more bequest response in a model with precautionary savings, with uncertain lifetimes and no annuities markets. Uh, and with the bequest motive, people would share some of the future consumption increases with their children, again, as was noted by the authors. Uh, this might only be a problem in the short run, but it would, again, affect the, trans the desirability of this policy in a, in a key transitional period. Uh, the model, as I understand it, is a closed economy model, as yesterday's discussion indicated. Uh, modeling an open economy w would make a big difference. The model has no uncertainty. Uh, as some authors yesterday noted, there's an insurance value to progressive taxation, which isn't reflected in the model. And that would actually reduce the welfare gains from going from an income tax to a consumption tax. And there are doubtless many other margins on which uncertainty would matter. 
Uh, one thing that would help in terms of figuring out how important these different assumptions are would be to do some sensitivity analysis, which I think are, are feasible within this model framework. One, so basically there are three sources of efficiency gains in the model. One is from eliminating progressive rates, deductions, and credits under the personal income tax and eliminating the corporate income tax. So one thing that would be yeah, nice to do, I talked to John about this yesterday, I think he said it, it was feasible, uh, would be to just measure this effect alone. Go from the progressive income tax with consumption tax to a flat income tax and see how, how big that effect is. Because obviously that, that's another avenue for tax reform that doesn't require going to a consumption tax. Uh, Second, there's eliminating the sectoral distortions, leveling the playing field. I think you could model this by holding capital and labor fixed, uh, but allowing people to re allowing a reallocation of capital among sectors and measuring the effect of that change. And then finally, removing the intertemporal distortion, and that's really the effect of, uh, of going to a consumption tax. Uh, it would obviously also be nice to vary the other parameters in the model, the elasticities of substitution. Uh, one thing in particular is that the adjustment costs for housing are not all at the business side, they're also at the individual side. They're big transaction costs to moving, especially for those in owner occupied housing. So, what you might do would be to model an elasticity of substitution between rental and owner occupied housing that's a lot smaller in the short run than it is in the longer run, over five or ten years. Uh, and, and look at lower and maybe higher intertemporal elasticities as well. Other real world limitations, uh, one key one is that I think about 80% or more of people in the United States are already in a consumption tax regime because all their savings or virtually all of them are in retirement savings which are tax free or in owner occupied housing which is virtually tax free. Uh, so presumably their work and saving decisions wouldn't be altered much in this model context anyway except possibly due to changes in the tax rate on labor. Uh, I think you might be able to incorporate this in, in the model with different income classes. Uh, dropping employer pensions, I don't actually know how you would model this, but dropping employer pensions in the real world could really reduce saving, and you might just note that in the paper because of, you know, not, not pure rational economics, but because of the fact that having employers set up pensions uh, is a big inducement to a lot of low and moderate income people to save. Uh, what are the implications for policy? Uh, one is, like my view is, I think there'd still be a lot of demand for transition relief, no matter how good you make this model. There are going to be individual firms within industries and individual sectors that think they're going to be worse off than they would be under the status quo. Uh, and the model shows, in one example, which is rental housing, where people really get hammered in the short run. Uh, it obviously, well, I, nonetheless, I think this is an extremely useful intellectual tool. I think it's a real contribution, and I applaud the authors for their work on this paper, and I look forward to seeing future versions of it. Well, I also like this paper, and I think it does provide a lot of useful insights into the effects on the transition. Uh, I think the results they're getting are basically right, including their um, discussion of how uncertain, how unknown some of those results are. Um, I guess in view of uh, Lynn's story about the uh, Houston Chronicle, I definitely don't want to omit the uh, disclaimer uh, that the views I'm expressing are not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or the Dallas Fed or anyone else, uh, just, uh, just me. So what I'm going to do is uh, first very briefly discuss the model structure and the, uh, that the authors use and the policy reform that they choose to uh, examine, then spend a little bit more time talking about the uh, results they get, and then uh, briefly close with a few recommendations for further work and for some revisions and sensitivity uh, tests. So on the model structure, I think that the model is well, I think the structure is well chosen. Uh, you know, as Len said, there's a lot of trade-offs involved in these things. Clearly, many aspects of reality are unavoidably omitted. Nonetheless, I think the model does have the key features that are really needed to study the transitional effects of tax reform on the 
price or value of existing capital. Uh, first of all, it is a general equilibrium model. It has rational expectations. And then I think this is critical, uh, the multi-sector nature of the model. Given the different effects on owner-occupied housing and business capital, you really have to look at those separately. Uh, politically, of course, it's also important to uh, break them out. And once you have the owner-occupied housing, I think including the rental housing, of course, is a separate sector. Uh, instead of mixing it in with the rest of the business sector, it is exactly the right way to go. So it is restrictive along some dimensions. I mean, and actually, this could be, of course, several slides because it would be easy to sit up here and list all the aspects of reality that uh, are, are left out, and Lenz mentioned some of them. There's no heterogeneity within the cohorts, and the model is deterministic. Uh, neither of these, I guess, bother me that much uh, if the purpose at hand is to examine the transitional effects on asset prices. Uh, the model is also a closed economy. I do think that is one area where it would be useful to generalize it, more so than with the, the other two. Um, it would, among other things, let you look at the value of cross-border holdings. Uh, and of course, there's some interesting issues there, destination versus origin base and so on. The policy reform that's being examined, of course, is a uh, revenue neutral uh, switch to the uh, flat tax. So this really does have a couple different uh, components to it. First, there is the reduction in progressivity, and that's what's driving the long run labor supply gains that the authors get. There's nothing about the moving to the consumption tax base that would necessarily increase labor supply, but you do get that from having a less progressive uh, rate schedule. So of course, as part of uh, uh, moving to a consumption tax base, you repeal the uh, tax on interest income and the corresponding deduction for interest expense, including the mortgage interest deduction. That's part and parcel of moving to that base. Like all real world consumption taxes, of course, owner-occupied housing is taxed on a uh, prepayment uh, basis. You are not allowed a deduction for the purchase of the home, you are then not taxed on the imputed rent or deduct any of the expenses against that rent. So of course the repeal of the property tax deduction is part and parcel of adopting the uh, prepayment uh, method. This is a pure textbook reform. There is no continuing preference for owner-occupied housing. Obviously the President's panel uh, chose a different path in that regard. There is no transition relief and the panel chose a different path there as well. There is no binding limit one gathers on the law deductions uh, that firms uh, can take. Uh, this is an issue that's been discussed, uh, of course, um, and uh, uh, is, a, is a problem, but uh, again, assumed away in order to focus on a pure textbook reform. The reform is immediate, not anticipated, so it, uh, the author cites up any of the uh, transitional effects of the tax avoidance behavior that might take effect during the period while the reform is being uh, considered and announced and adopted. So turning to the results, the authors do find declines in the value of uh, capital, particularly uh, the rental um, housing and to a lesser extent the other business capital. Those results are sensitive to the adjustment costs, uh, and I think that's right, as I'll explain. The owner-occupied housing declines, though, are smaller than those in studies which explicitly or implicitly assume infinite adjustment costs, that there's basically like no quantity adjustment. And I think the authors, of course, are, are quite right on that, that uh, the results from those other studies that, that make that restrictive assumption just you know, do not make uh, sense. Well, here's the organizing framework that I, I found it useful to, uh, to just think about this in, and of course it's a very familiar one. Uh, how does uh, existing capital's value get affected when we make this type of reform? Well, in the steady state of the income tax, before we head into it, the value of the uh, capital is going to equal to one, just normalize the, the cost of producing and installing the capital, minus any discount uh, that existing capital may bear relative to the price of newly produced capital under the uh, existing income tax system. After reform, uh, immediately after reform, the value under the consumption tax is going to equal the new uh, cost of producing uh, new capital, producing and installing, uh, which we can call uh, Q sub C0, which of course may be different from one uh, if adjustment costs are present, and then multiply by one minus the discount factor uh, that applies under a consumption tax system. So you really have the three uh, key values here. What is the discount under the consumption tax, the discount under the income tax, in both cases for existing capital relative to the cost of producing and installing new capital, and then what is the change in the price of, uh, in the, price of the new capital uh, or the cost of it when you make this uh, switch. So I mean, we put these under the known, unknown, and unknowable th categories, I guess. I did not uh, bold them or read them or anything like that, but uh, um, 
for uh, the, the one thing we know is the existing uh, discount for existing capital under a uh, pure consumption tax of the type that the authors are examining. Uh, for business capital taxed under a true uh, consumption tax basis, of course, uh, it equals the uh, tax rate, a standard result any time that there's expensing. And so that's true for, for both types of business capital in the model. Of course, the owner-occupied housing is taxed on a, a prepayment basis. And so for that, the discount under the consumption tax equals uh, zero. And that would also be true in a, in a broader model. It would also be true of consumer durables and of the capital held by state and local governments and by uh, nonprofit organizations. All of those things uh, get uh, prepayment uh, treatment under all of the consumption tax proposals that I've seen. So moving to the next uh, value, the existing capital discount under the income tax is, uh, I think, mildly unknown. I guess that's how I would uh, phrase it. Um, it is not known the way that the consumption tax discount is. And so let's take a look at how the authors uh, what they do on that. So, of course, it depends on the timing of the income tax. If you really have a pure income tax collected on a concurrent basis uh, with income, the tax is always being proportional to net income, fixed fraction over the life of the investment, whatever the fraction may be, then, of course, there's no discount. But there is a positive discount any time the taxes are backloaded, which, of course, can happen with accelerated depreciation or investment tax credits. So you can easily back out, I guess, from Table 3, uh, and I, I think I've done this correctly, what the uh, discount is that the authors uh, have in their income tax uh, study state. Uh, this is the discount to total capital. Um, so, you know, just not worrying about debt and equity, but just the discount for total capital. Rental housing gets a, there's a no discount owner-occupied housing. It's taxed on a concurrent basis with a rate, as it happens, of zero. Uh, so, of course, there's no discount. The rental housing gets a very mild discount under the existing system, which is why, of course, it gets hammered by the switch to the consumption tax. Uh, I believe they've got a 2% discount there, and I back out a 10% discount for the non-housing capital, and so that reflects uh, accelerated depreciation. So this is, parameter is mildly unknown, and there's different ways to estimate it. Uh, so what changes could be made and what the authors have done? As I read the paper, the authors are trying to model the 2003 tax system as sort of being their income tax steady state, so they've got uh, bonus depreciation or temporary partial expensing in their uh, baseline. And now that that provision has expired, and I don't think there was ever that strong a probability that it was going to be made permanent, although some may disagree with that. But now that it's expired, I think that should, uh, should be dropped uh, from the uh, model. And then, of course, there would be a, a smaller discount under the existing uh, system. Um, the authors uh, use the, they don't use the new view of dividend taxes, they use the other view, which uh, you know, I still call it the old view, but I lear learned at this uh, conference that it's now called the traditional view, so I think I missed the memo on that one, but uh, uh, whatever that other view is, that's what they're assuming. And I think the evidence, uh, you know, probably that we have, which is inconclusive and, you know, mildly unknown, would justify probably at least, probably moving to a blended view of the old and the new. You know, the 50-50 just seems to be canonical in some circles, uh, but, um, there's certainly a lot of theoretically attractive features of the new view, so partially incorporating that would be useful. And, of course, that would raise the discount, since under the new view, the dividend taxes are, uh, are a backloaded tax with respect to, uh, to each uh, given investment, uh, tax savings when you invest and reduce dividends, tax collections later. And then, of course, the intangible capital, which already gets expensing, I think really should be reflected. And some of the comments yesterday make clear how important that is. I really think that is an important thing to bring in. And that would raise DY. So I don't know what the net impact here would be. You know, the authors are apologetic in, a, in at least one, maybe two footnotes about how the part of the return to capital may be the risk premium, and they're really leaving that out by looking at the uh, by looking at a deterministic model. But you know, the uh, the, re the difference of the return from the risk-free rate you know has zero market value, or at least should have zero market value. So in fact, that really should not have any implications for what the percentage reduction is going to be in the value of existing capital. So the authors really, I think, do not need to apologize about uh, that. Um, so now we move to something that is uh, more unknown, as I'm going to say in a moment, and that's the estimate, of course, of what happens to uh, to Q as we move to this new uh, consumption tax. You know, uh, I think John described one of the scenarios as being zero adjustment costs, but as mentioned in the paper, uh, the adjustment costs are positive in that uh, scenario. Uh, they're just low. And uh, of course, if they were literally zero, then, then the Q would be uh, stuck at uh, one, but uh, it's, it's low. And so uh, as we can see here, uh, of course, the uh, non-housing capital goes up in value, more so if the uh, adjustment costs are high. The rental uh, housing, um, the 
value of new capital goes up, uh, again, more so if the adjustment costs are high. And then, of course, the owner-occupied housing goes down in value, more so if the, um, if the adjustment costs are, are high. I've backed these values out of the tables as well, so hopefully I've done them uh, right. Uh, I think I uh, have done so. So I think that this change here, this really is strongly unknown. Uh, you know, more than it's not just mildly unknown. Uh, so of course we know there's an increased demand for business capital of both types and a reduced demand for owner-occupied housing. So one thing you've got to do is just get that demand down right, and there's a lot of problems with that, as we'll see. But then, of course, the adjustment costs determine the split of how that demand change is broken down between the quantity and the price. And you know, we are really, uh, really off in the deeply unknown at that uh, point. So with respect to the demand for capital, um, you know, both the uh, demand for the total capital stock and the allocation across these sectors, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here. The first order issues, I think, are the elasticity of intertemporal substitution and the elasticities of the cross-sector substitutions. Um, and I think sensitivity analysis needs to be done on those. I don't have any particular objection to the values the authors have chosen. In fact, I think they, they seem like pretty good values. Uh, but I think you just, you've got to do some uh, sensitivity analysis. The way that the class are handled is going to be of some importance as well. That determines the change in the total savings response and therefore the increase in the demand uh, for uh, the overall capital. Um, and uh, this target bequest assumption, I think, is certainly extreme and is unrealistic. And so, again, I think some sensitivity analysis with other models of bequest should be adopted. Um, I'm not going to venture to give a lot of specific advice here because this is an area I think we really do not understand very well. And uh, so I really just have to suggest that different alternatives be considered. So then we move to the adjustment cost, the other determinant of the change in Q. And I think uh, the magnitude is unknown. That is the one sensitivity analysis the authors have in the paper. And if you're only going to have you know, one element of sensitivity analysis, and of course I know the authors are going to do more as they revise this, you know, this is the one. And you can see, I think, from the results how sensitive uh, things are to the magnitude of the adjustment costs. And I'm not sure whether the authors have spanned the entire you know, interval of realistic adjustment costs or not. You know, I do think, though, there is a deeper point as well, and I don't know to what extent this can be addressed, but, you know, the form of the adjustment costs are really unknown as well. So, you know, for example, I mean, we love quadratic adjustment costs. I mean, you know, what could be, could be better than quadratic? But, uh, you know, in the real world, you've got to think they're asymmetrical. And, you know, for example, the conversion of owner-occupied housing into rental housing, you know, once that gross investment goes, goes negative, that's got to be a different kind of animal than, uh, you know, just reducing the uh, replacement investment. Uh, or then it would be if you expand from the expansion of investment, these costs have got to be uh, to be asymmetrical to some extent. You could have a, a time to build uh, formulation uh, affecting investment that would give you a different type of friction than the quadratic adjustment cost. Uh, there's a paper by uh, Edge and Rudd, maybe a couple of them, at the uh, Board of Governors where they examine, uh, I guess the paper I looked at was examining the effects of bonus depreciation, but they do some sensitivity analysis of their results just with respect to different ways of modeling investment frictions. So, they, I mean, they make an argument that I think is a little bit plausible that instead of or in addition to having adjustment costs of changing the stock of capital, there could be such cost of changing the flow of investment. So that's something a firm might not be able to do on, on short notice. And uh, that is a, a different, different kind of uh, creature. Or there could be a uh, cost uh, involved in changing the capital labor ratio. And I think there's actually other you know, things you could do that Edge and Rudd don't even mention. Of course, also, you know, I don't know why uh, investment alone gets, uh, you know, tagged with having adjustment costs. I mean, of course, there's certainly overwhelming evidence that those are present in some form or another for investment, but it's perfectly plausible that you would have adjustment costs to changing consumption or labor supply as well. You know, you kind of, putting those in, of course, solves the problem Jane keeps uh, mentioning. You know, the short-run response is just always unbelievably large. And, I mean, that could mean that the models we use have, you know, really deep flaws, and I guess Jane would, would say that. But, of course, uh, certainly one way to, to address it is just to have a, a broader range of, uh, of adjustment costs. So in terms of uh, further research, I think the sensitivity analysis, again, which I'm sure the authors are planning to do as they revise this, to look at those uh, elasticities, the sensitivity for the bequest motives, uh, maybe the alternative forms of adjustment cost. Maybe that's some, more than the authors really want to tackle. The open economy, again, I think would be good, but it may also be beyond what the authors uh, really want to do. In terms of the experiment to examine, I don't know that the flat tax really is, you know, I mean, I think it's a, it's a fine one to examine, but I certainly would suggest as well, either as well or instead, examining the, uh, per, the progressive uh, X tax. 
Um, first of all, I think that's politically more on the table. That's the option that the pre panel looked at. Uh, they did not look at the, uh, at the flat tax. Now, having the progressive rates, of course, also would be useful because it would be a cleaner way. I mean, Len suggested, I think, the opposite approach of taking the, um, uh, I'm almost done here, taking the, uh, um, moving to the flat rate structure and then, you know, going to consumption. But I think a way to do it that really matches what people are looking at politically is, you know, don't, don't look at the, uh, the progress, the reduction of progressivity, switch from the uh, progressive income tax to the progressive X tax. That really isolates moving to the consumption tax base. Now, what result are you going to get? Well, there's a higher tax rate on business cash flow in any of these X tax options because, you know, you have a top rate on the wages of maybe 30 percent, maybe more, and then the, you know, the custom, of course, always is you tax the business cash flow and hence the existing capital at that rate. So you're actually going to get a bigger levy on the existing uh, business uh, capital, uh, both types of uh, business capital. And um, so, um, you know, I think one interesting point here is that um, uh, the X tax, um, if you don't have transition rules, actually does give you a bigger hit on the existing capital than would a sales tax or a VAT or a flat tax, uh, simply because the rate that is being applied uh, to the business cash flow is going to be higher. Of course, I think it's Larry's point that obviously the transition relief is much more likely under an X tax than it would be under a, a retail sales tax. So some of these things are unknown. Are any, is anything unknowable? I don't think anything is like truly, truly unknowable on the positive side of the analysis. Normatively, you know, I just find this one of the hardest questions to think about is the assessment of the capital of Avon. Larry's a big champion of it. I think all of us have some sympathy with that. We know the efficiency advantages, but I think there's some concerns a lot of us have about fairness. It was the point that uh, Dan Shaviro has raised about uh, what is the logical relationship of doing this, this one-time uh, capital levy or wealth tax to uh, changing the uh, taxation of new saving. So anyway, I enjoyed the paper a lot and uh, appreciate the opportunity to discuss it. Thanks. Okay, we got a very few minutes for questions to presenters and discussants. We're going to start with Larry since everybody's been quoting him. And James, if they might be quoting her, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> well, I think this is also, I, I agree, this is a very impressive paper. Uh, two things is just on the uh, list that Alan just said. You know, we're making these lump sum transfers to older people, wealthy people, a lot of, many of whom are wealthy through Medicare or Medicaid. The amazing thing about this paper is how small the welfare losses are to the initial older generations. Uh, I guess you get at most 11 percent. Uh, that's a big 11 percent is a non-trivial loss, but it's not. It's not 23 percent, which is kind of the tax, or 20 percent. That's the kind of the, the range of the tax. And with the adjustment costs, which is real, that's without adjustment costs. With adjustment costs, around the 3 percent welfare loss. And these these folks have been getting 3 percent, you know, Medicare, you know, huge Medicare. Uh, windfalls year after year, and they have a huge wall windfall from cutting capital gains tax rates and dividend tax rates. So, I mean, look at how happy Leo is, and he's just been getting <laughs> transfers left and right. Uh, uh, so, uh, but back to your model, the uh, the other thing about the gains in the long run, uh, they would be bigger if you were modeling the demographics and the expansion of the you know, taxes that would have to arise to accommodate the this high, had the higher spending in the future that uh, we're presumably going to be having to live with unless we can get control of the spending. So uh, that's I mean when I when I did my most recent simulation study of of the fair tax, much bigger, quite dramatic increases, improvements for the uh, well-being of future generations, especially poor ones. Really, really big, you know, 20% welfare gains as opposed to you're having more like 5%, I think, long run welfare gains. And so, just wondering where exactly that's coming from. You know, there might be, in fact, we have three income classes. Uh, interesting to track with them, but I, I'm very impressed by what you did. I, I love your model. <laughs> Anybody want to respond? I'm, I'm surprised. <laughs> I'll just kind of comment. We're making a lot of these changes. Uh, we've graduated been working on the, the open economy piece uh, and adding different firms as well. Joy. Is, is, it, is your pay, is your model in Fortran or what? Uh, MATLAB. MATLAB. Uh, and we have um, so we have tax. You know, we have pieces that we didn't use for this paper, such as tax deferred savings, to, to take account of 
you know, you know, explicitly how people are saving uh, as opposed to the ad hoc way that I deal with it in the paper by just lowering the tax rate. Would it help you to see our code? I mean, when we think about the adding, it's, like, it's, such, it's such a big ordeal to put one of these models together. <laughs> I just think that they start well, well, it might be especially for the uh, for the demographics part yeah. because that's something we haven't. I mean, most of the points that were raised uh, today, we we've either uh, done in various versions of the model or at least thought about. But the, the demographic part uh, we have, and also Len's point about this notion of a, a varying elasticity of substitution as a way of modeling the the transition of uh, owner occupied housing and housing. That, that's a, uh, an easy, and, easily done and uh, good idea. And I think Alan's point of, of the labor supply adjustment cost would, would, would be a nice feature. Alan, do you respond to the layer? Yeah, just a couple, like, just two quick comments. I guess, you know, the capital levy is such a difficult thing to think about, but, you know, I think the case for, like, taking resources away from the older generations is, you know, pretty compelling to me. And, again, that disclaimer, not the Dallas Fed. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, that's absolutely right, it seems to me. There is a, one of the things that I think troubles me about the capital levy is just targeting the people who have chosen to save in the past. You know, that among the elderly, it is they who will be hit. Uh, while we're actually saying going forward, you know, we want to actually treat saving more favorably. So, in a sense, to kind of justify the capital levy, you've got to go one step beyond saying we want to take resources away from the, the older generation. To my mind, that first step is the easy one, then the second is, is the uh, harder. You know, the expanding size of government is kind of ambiguous in its effects, isn't it? Because if you are maintaining more or less contemporaneous budget balance, then you have the consumption tax rate going up over time, and it does bring back some of the you know, tax penalty on savings. So on the one hand, you've got a bigger tax system that you're putting your efficiency into, but on the other hand, one of the efficiency features is actually being diluted. And let me add that we've done a lot of sensitivity analysis already. We didn't include it in the paper for when it was long, and two, you know when you got the paper. So, but but for the... For, and while transition relief does affect as, uh, the, the, the business equity asset prices, the, the, the owner-occupied and the rental housing prices, are, especially the owner-occupied, are, are relatively robust to, uh, to, to almost any parameter value, not to mention that, that a lot of our parameter values are, are kind of pessimistic. And so, I mean, I know Jane would like a labor supply of zero. But I I, I've used lower okay. ones, that, and I've used lower that, than so I've had. Certainly, and I, with respect to the interest rate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and 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 Tom Neesner you know, would, would well, like people, it higher. So we we'll go on. Questions we need to be all kosher. Jane, then Jim Paterba, then Alan Auerbach. Yeah, I just want to ask a question then um, uh, about how something's sure. done in the model. Um, if you if everybody just bought assets directly, everybody gets you know a deduction for the cost of the assets. But if you actually buy your asset via buying corporate stock, it would seem to me that the, you need that corporate stock to fall fully in value to get the full power of the consumption tax. Uh, and so I just don't know how you deal with that problem. But I used to say when I first said corporate stock should fall by 30% in value, uh, and the people said, no, that can't happen. I said, well, if it never happens, then you don't have a consumption tax, at least for that part of assets. Why would there be a problem with that? Because when you go to buy a share of corporate stock, if the stock doesn't fall by the full amount of the but why wouldn't discount. It, if it's a business level tax. Well, because they've got adjustment cost. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with where the taxes are set. But the the value is going to be reflected in stock market value. So if you don't go actually buy physical assets, I mean somebody's got to give the firm money. Well, if we did our if we did the calculation just which is back of the envelope of, of, of the present value discounted cash flow, uh -huh. and we, and you have no no offsetting factors. I mean, you get something like you said. Yeah. Well, I mean, you get it basically you get in rental housing. Exactly. In rental housing, you've got pretty close to the. Uh -huh. Let me just respond a different way on this because. I think what's going on, Jane, is you're saying, well, if we know adjustment costs that fall by 30%, but only falls by 15%, then where's the big, why do you, in the long why run, do you go by stock, right? In the long run, we know that we end up at the same steady state, because in the long run, so right. with, without adjustment costs. So what's going right. on is that over the transition path, the uh, there's capital losses arising as you kind of have adjusted that would not otherwise have arisen. So, the, and that that's hitting transitional generations. So, this kind of loss is there, it's just postponed, is what I think is going on. Right. 
But wouldn't that affect your savings behavior? Uh, it's going to delay the transition. We don't have anything to do with whether the statute is assessed as a business. Yeah, yeah, that's a separate. Having adjustment costs certainly you know, dampens the immediate yeah. saving response. Right. I mean, that's that's absolutely sense. right. If I could, yeah. in one scenario, go buy a share of corporate stock this, that falls that's thirty percent cheaper, and in this scenario, my the stock only falls by fifteen percent. This seems to be the incentive for me to put my money into the corporate sector small. And that we move on. Jim <laughs> two, two quick points on owner-occupied housing. One is I think it's very important to allow some heterogeneity within the owner-occupied housing sector since uh, the kind of house that's typically lived in by someone who's at the top marginal rate in the initial scenario and is using a lot of debt, uh, you know, the, the sort of Silicon Valley uh, first-time buyer at this point, is likely to be very different in terms of house price reactions from the houses that are lived in by many of the elderly who are not in those kinds of neighborhoods and who are not relying a lot on debt, and the buyers of their houses aren't relying a lot on debt. So I think that's, that's a key thing to think about. The other thing is the assumption about the target request, and I think it actually interacts with the housing part a bit. You know, but one of the ways we may play out this, you know, this fiscal scenario going forward is we might force the older cohort at some point through reductions in spending programs to, to draw down their housing way that prior cohorts have not done before they die. Right? A lot of the prior cohorts have bequeathed a lot of their unoccupied housing. Uh, you could imagine that the baby boomers may be forced to spend down their house by reverse annuity mortgaging or things like that to cover medical costs as they age. Well, if you've got the target request in there, in some sense you, uh, you, you preclude that kind of adjustment from taking place. So I think that may be an assumption to relax in the future. Yeah, and I, I think it's not even an issue of sensitivity. I think we're just going to change the assumption and we're sort of experimenting with different, different approaches. Two, two more, Robert. All right, but I was next. <laughs> Those previous interjections don't count. No, I don't think <laughs> I, as I understand what you've done, you're assuming the interest rate changes each period. You have basically a short rate is the only rate you have, which means that when you in, in, introduce a consumption tax, you've got an increase in the after-tax interest rate, a reduction in the before-tax interest rate. And you've also got an R-based tax, which means you're no more taxation of interest, no more deduction, and so forth. Um, I think uh, if you take into account the fact that rental housing is likely to be highly leveraged and the, the debt, the maturity of the of the rental housing is not going to be floating rate uh, uh, borrowing, but probably a longer longer maturity. That's going to exacerbate the decline in the value of rental housing because you're going to have leveraged positions where they get hit on the debt side by the fact that the uh, they're paying a, you know they, they don't get the benefit of a lower borrowing rate. Lower, lower before tax rate. And unless, unless that's somehow already taken into account in the way I don't see it, I think that would increase the, the equity loss uh, on, on rental housing. Why, why couldn't they refinance? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we, I mean, basically, we're assuming that, that, yeah. that they do. That's, yeah, because it drops. It would depend on the conditions of the contract. Yeah. Okay. okay. Property Robert. housing is not any more leverage than anything else. We'll take that up at lunch. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Henry. Henry. Um, <laughs> I want to urge again uh, the, uh, clo the importance of the closed economy, open economy issue. Uh, in the open economy case, I assume you would simply implement it. One of the ways of implementing it would be to say there was no change in the uh, before tax interest rate. Uh, the second thing is, I'm really uncomfortable with strong comments about the housing market from a model of this kind. Uh, there are two dominant facts, I'm in a way extending uh, Jim's comments, there are two dominant facts about housing markets. The first is there's a very low ratio of investment to capital stock. And in some markets, some markets, it's zero. Uh, markets in which uh, population is declining, others in which it's expanding very rapidly and the ratio is higher. Those are very different conditions for uh, uh, this kind of a tax term. The second is there's enormous heterogeneity with respect to housing prices, with respect to average personal tax rates in given communities and hence the value of deductibility or even the likelihood of deductibility. Uh, and in the ratio of housing costs to income. Uh, 
the there's an old uh, clip about uh, the Platte River at six inches deep that you can drown in it. Uh, I think that's the case uh, on the average. Uh, I think that's the case with housing markets. To discuss the impact of a major tax change on housing markets without spending a sizable part of the exposition on this issue of heterogeneity, it seems to me is a serious uh, drawback in the usefulness of the paper. It really is important, I think, to start with the markets and then try to apply the model to them rather than start with the model and not even get to the sub-markets. Do one of the authors wish to respond? Well, I, I agree with the point. I think we're, we're not starting with it. We're not really doing either one. We're kind of starting with a model and, and, and building the model as we go. So you're on the way station. Okay. We're, we're on the way. Yeah. The, 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 so, I mean, the, the, real, the real advantage, I think, of the multi-income group within each generation is going to be to, to capture no, at least some of the heterogeneity you're talking a about. A very small part of it. Uh, because, uh, you know, some uh, town in Ohio or a city in Ohio where population is declining and they haven't built a new house yeah, in, in a decade is not the same thing as Silicon Valley. Okay, with that, we have to wrap it up. <laughs>